to Fruity Knitting. I'm Andrea. And I'm Fiona. And this is episode 119. Fruity Knitting is a 90-minute program bringing you knitting inspiration from around the world as well as extra snippets of travel, history and storytelling that we always hope adds joy to your life and brings a smile to your face. We have another fantastic program lined up for you. Through popular demand, I've invited Fiona back on the couch with me and I've also convinced our other sister, Michaela, to make an appearance in this episode. So it's turning into a real family show, isn't it? You'll have to call the show The Olsen Sisters or better yet, The Fruity Olsen Sisters. Yeah. And we even have the Olsen Twins. That's true, we do. But they're not called Mary-Kate and Ashley. True. They're called Freya Wren and Torvi. A Scandinavian ring. But we do have a very full house. You're really sharp this morning. <laughs> I think the babies have slept. They did. They've slept through the night, so she's, she's awake today. So back to our program. Our feature interview is one that Madeline and I filmed in the UK last September, and Madeline is actually doing the interviewing. It's her debut feature interview. And our guest, Daniela Dean, is a professional costume maker who specialises in gold work embroidery. And Daniela trained as a costume interpreter at the very prestigious Wimbledon University. And she's created costumes for West End shows in London, for the London Olympics, and for many television and film productions. Now, even though the subject is not directly about knitting, I am so excited about presenting this interview because of Daniela's exceptional skill. So the content of what Dan Dan Daniela talks about and shows us is just so spectacular. You're going to really love it. And then I've also recently travelled to Maclay Island, which is a tiny tropical island in Moreton Bay, Queensland, and I went there to visit our older sister, Michaela. And while I was there, Michaela and I sat down together to show you some of the craft projects that she's done over the years, including a really beautiful silk ribbon embroidery, tapestry. Embroidery. Embroidery. <laughs> Andrea also took out the drone and filmed some of the beautiful landscape on the island for an extreme stitching segment. Yeah. <laughs> so that's included. And I'm excited to give you an update on the current projects I'm working on. And my two eldest daughters, Simba and Leia, will also make their usual appearance at the end of the show as the Little Bush Fairies. Yeah, it's going to be a good program. So we'll start with Bring and Brag because Fiona's finished her Ribblesdale vest by Lily Kate France and we've, we've got our live event with Lily Kate France this weekend and the Shetland patrons can attend that and the audio podcast of the event will be available for Shetland and Merino patrons in about one week's time when I've edited it. Last episode I was working on the Ribblesdale vest by Lily Kate France. I'd nearly finished it, I just had the ribbing around the neckline and the front opening to go. Well, today I'm happy to bring you the finished vest in Bring and Brag. I'll hold it for you. I was inspired to knit this design by my niece, Madeline, who did an absolutely gorgeous job of hers. And I'm happy with mine, but there's definitely room for improvement. So here are some tips and notes from a beginner's perspective. Next time around, I would knit a larger size, but with smaller needles. That way I could create a neater, tighter fabric. It would still be stretchy enough due to the nature of brioche, but I'd have the added bonus of the stitches looking neater. I do have some sloppy stitches, which I've tried to hide. It's pretty neat. It's pretty good. <laughs> well, in hindsight, I'd be more intentional about creating neat, tight stitches, particularly around the edges, like the armholes yeah, and the front opening. That's true. And just like with my first garment, the Devote, which I showed you in the last episode, I've lengthened the ribbing to account for my long torso. But this proved problematic when it came to spacing the buttonholes because I could no longer follow the formula in the pattern. So I had to wing it with my own dodgy calculations. <laughs> and in the end, I settled for the top button being closer than the others. Yeah, you know what? You, yes. Actually, I just thought of this. You do the button band at the end. So if you'd told me about it. I know, but you were busy. I know. And I was desperate just to get on and complete it. <laughs> <laughs> but it looks really good. All right, thank you. These are the pretty wooden buttons that I chose. Uh, Andrea can't believe we don't have a decent yarn store nearby, but I assured her I'm from a generation that's very happy to shop online. <laughs> yes, but it is really advantageous to see wool in person and to feel it because sometimes you can you think a colour is a certain way that's and true. you get it. Because it looks not... different on yeah. different websites. Yeah, it does. Okie dokie. So they are very pretty buttons. 
These I grabbed from eBay. I knew I wanted wooden buttons, but these attracted me by the pretty holes in them, which give them a lighter look and balances the pink mass of chunky stitches out quite nicely. The vest is a bottom-up seamless construction, which was a first for me. Yeah. And although it was kind of fun, I'm not in a hurry to do this type of construction again. For a start, I didn't set myself up well. My circular needles are on the shorter side, so when it came to picking up all those stitches around the neck and the front, my knitting was all bunched up, which was very awkward. <laughs> yes. And I couldn't see how neat or not my stitches were until I'd actually bound them all off, which by then it was too late to fix any mistakes. Mind you, if you had a yarn store just around the corner, you could have whipped down there and got <laughs> a longer circular needle. But since we live so remotely here, yeah. Who anyway. has the time to wait for the online post? Yes. <laughs> so far, I prefer knitting in pieces. Mostly because when it comes to shaping the back and the neck, there's only one set of increases and decreases to wrap my beginner's mind around. Okay, yeah. So you mean like if you're only doing a front section, then you're only ever decreasing on the neck edge and one side of the armhole edge at the same time instead of neck, two armholes, another two armholes, and another yeah. neck all in one row. That's yeah. too many. Yeah. This is a good construction for this vest. It's just that... It's just I'm a total beginner. Yeah, but you're doing brilliantly. So keep going. What next? Well, I also find a seamless construction heavier on the needles. So I'm going to blame at least two of my sloppy stitches on that. That's true. I'm yeah. not in a hurry to do brioche again either. I do love the look of it, but I think I'd rather tick off cables, lace and colour work before I play with brioche again. Type A personality here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of everyone else because hopefully my mistakes are easier to fix this time with the other techniques and then my sailor mouth doesn't have to make such a frequent appearance. <laughs> I have learned a ton of new skills though, which have really pushed me mentally. Yeah. I think it's because of the current phase of life I'm in with two newborn babies and two other young kids running around, yeah. a homeschool to plan and a household to run. Every stitch has felt like a stolen moment. And a demanding older sister. <laughs> <laughs> but if I wasn't so stretched, I imagine I would have made fewer mistakes and the overall quality of the garment would have been better. But I'm lucky to be knitting it all, so no more complaints here. And it's and it's gorgeous. You've really done a great job. I suppose. Yeah. You're always more critical of your own work. Yeah. So what about the wool? Because the wool well, is beautiful. First, I want to rattle off my new skills. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Tubular cast on, brioche stitch, picking up stitches around the neckline, creating buttonholes, three needle bind off, I cord bind off and tubular cast off. And they all sound so next level to me. So I'm pretty pleased with myself. I, you're definitely <laughs> a project knitter. I can yeah. see that. <laughs> also, I should mention how refreshing it is to read a pattern written by an indie designer. Everything was laid out for me. There was no mystery. Mm. I didn't have to rewrite anything. And there were video tutorials for all the tricky bits. So thank you, Lily. I feel like you wrote this pattern just for me. Also, Lily's yarn was a pleasure to work with. Yeah. It's the Axis. It's 90% Merino and 10% Suri Alpaca. And my vest has been rummaging down the bottom of my knitting basket for weeks. And my three-year-old Leia keeps coming up and attacking it with a pair of needles, pretending it's her own knitting. I know. She says, look, I can knit. <laughs> I've done three rows. Boom. <laughs> so it's copped a fair bit of abuse, but there's still no sign of peeling. Yeah. So that's a bonus. Yeah. It's, it's lovely, lovely yarn. And the colour I chose is called Love Number, and it's the perfect shade of dusty pink to go with nearly everything in my wardrobe. So you're going to see Fiona modelling the Riverstar vest coming up now, and also my recently finished snowfall, which I'm going to tell you about on the other side. Every morning every evening ain't we got fun not much money oh but honey ain't we got fun the rent's unpaid dear we haven't a car but anyway dear we'll stay as we are even if we owe the grocer Though we have fun Tax collectors getting closer Still we have fun There's nothing surer The rich get rich and the poor get poorer 
In the meantime, in between time, ain't we got fun? Don't we have fun? Still we have fun. You look really great in your Ribbles Tail Fest, so congratulations on finishing your second garment. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> she also looked pretty good in my finished snowfall. Thank goodness I finally finished this. This is also another design by Kim Hargraves. And we actually have a Kim Hargraves knit along going on in the Fruity Knitting Ravelry group and also in the Fruity Knitting Patron Community Forum. So uh, Kim Hargraves is one of my all-time favourite composers. Composers. Designers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking composers all the time. Designers. And she's actually a second generation hand knit designer. Her mother, Kathleen Hargraves, designed for Rowan for 20 years. And then in the last 18 years, Kathleen and Kim have been working together as a mother daughter team. And during that time, they have published 45 books, which is really remarkable, isn't it? And They've, unfortunately, they're announcing their retirement later this year, which is really sad for their fans. I'm one of their fans, obviously. Me too. Yep. <laughs> You're a big fan. And I do actually think that they will leave a hole in the hand knitting industry because it'll be hard to feel because their designs are really singular. And, for example, if I'm looking to knit a garment that is really fashionable, that looks like it's been bought in a high-end boutique, that's feminine and even a bit flirty or even risque, I would immediately just go to Kim Hargraves and look through her collections. And she's also a great designer if you're knitting for, say, a teenage daughter or um, early 20s and they're really particular about what they have to wear. It has to look fashionable. Like, she's a great designer just to go to, isn't she? Or in your late 30s. Or in your late 30s. <laughs> Mid to late. Yeah. <laughs> so if you do like Kim Hargraves' designs, come over, join in the Knit Along as a sort of celebration for the 40 years contribution that Kim and Kathleen have given to the hand knit industry. Yeah. Okay, so back to this lovely design. In the last episode, I told you that because Fiona has a long torso, I, actually, you hold this bit, I needed to add length in the armhole on the body. That was really easy to do. I just simply knitted for an extra two centimeters before starting the shoulder shaping. But then I had to recalculate the cap shaping on the sleeves so that the sleeves would fit really smoothly into the lengthened armhole on the body. Now, whenever I do this, I do try to be as efficient as possible and use as many of the stitch counts and written calculations in the pattern as I possibly can and only change what I need to. And because with Fiona, I was only adding length to the sleeve cap and not width, my row gauge was really, really important. So I'm going to try to tell you the, the steps that I took to do this. And for any newbies, any beginner garment knitters, this is a typical set-in sleeve. This is what you call a set-in sleeve. It's the most fitted sleeve and it's what you'll find on all jackets. And when I talk about a sleeve cap, that is really just from the underarm section up to here. That's the, the cap on the sleeve. Okay, so in general, the length of a sleeve cap needs to be between five and 10 centimeters shorter than the armhole length on the body. Actually, I'm gonna get you to hold one hand here and the other hand here. <laughs> That's good, just like that. That's perfect. Service. Thank you. Okay, so the sleeve cap needs to be between five and 10 centimeters shorter than the length of the armhole on the body. And the larger your bust is, then the shorter the sleeve cap needs to be in comparison to the length of the armhole on the body. So if you've got a very large bust, your sleeve cap needs to be closer to 10 centimetres shorter than the armhole length. And if you're fairly flat chested, the sleeve cap needs to be closer to five centimetres shorter than the armhole on the body. Now, Fiona, despite breastfeeding twins, your bust size is still fairly moderate. Hey, this is <laughs> the curviest I've ever been. <laughs> Nevertheless, I've given you a sleeve cap which is seven centimetres shorter than the armhole length. Okay. 
okay so from memory the armhole was about 22 centimeters and your sleeve cap I made 15 centimeters so now I'm going to show you a diagram just of the sleeve cap which is sort of shaped like a bell so it is sometimes called a bell cap and on the diagram you'll see the sections of the pa of the bell cap that I could just simply follow the stitch counts and calculations of the written pattern and the section that I had to rework myself so the initial underarm bind off on the sleeve cap must always match the initial underarm bind off on the body so I kept the pattern calculations for the initial bind off and also for the following 21 rows which is about the first five and a half centimeters and I've called that part of the bell cap section one. Next I looked at the top slope of the bell shape. The final bind off should be around a quarter of the upper arm width and the steep shaping that comes just before the final bind off is important as well for the fit around your shoulders. Therefore, I kept all the patterns calculations for the top 10 rows, including the final bind off, which is around the top two and a half centimeters in length. And I've called that part of the cap section three. So that just leaves the middle part, which I've called section two, and that's where I could fudge around and add length. So working with my row gauge, I needed to add 10 extra rows to section two. And to figure out how often I needed to decrease, I took the number of stitches left after I'd finished section one, which was 65 stitches, and I subtracted the decreased stitches at the top shaping in section three, which all together was 57 stitches. So 65 minus 57 is eight. This meant that I had to decrease eight stitches in section two, and I needed to add an extra two centimeters length in section two as well. So because I knew my row gauge, I knew how to calculate the correct ratio, which ended up being decrease one stitch at each end of the following fourth row, and do that four times, and then at each end of the following fifth row, and just do that once. Now, so, can you say that, translate that into beginner language? Okay, <laughs> I thought that was pretty clear, but anyway, hold it up again. Okay. What's really important is, so if you two hands again, please, madam, thank you. So this down here, you'll have, when you're doing your armhole shaping, you'll have a curve like this, and it might be, be in a, a sort of a pattern like cast off five stitches and then the next row three and the next two and then one one so that pattern of five three two one one you have to do exactly that on the first part of the shaping of the of the bell shape and that's so because that that de defines exactly what that curve is going to look like and that means that those curves can fit together nicely when you're sewing them together the body and the sleeve together so that's why that bit's important so I kept that the same but also an extra few centimeters so down the bottom you keep this bit the same as the pattern and then at the top of the sleeve right you're, you've got a final bind off which is going to be a, sh a straight line that section has to be a quarter of the width of the circumference of your upper arm so just say my upper arm would be 32 centimeters then that means it's eight centimeters okay so obviously if I have a bigger arm then I'll also be rounder here on the shoulders so that can afford to be wider so that's just a basic proportion the final bind off needs to be a quarter of the width of the armhole circumference. Okay, so that's your final bind off. And then you've got some steep shaping on either side of the final bind off. And that has to be, that's important because it makes it the top of the caps sit nicely around your shoulders. So if you're wanting to just be efficient, you follow the pattern for this section and use the stitch counts for this section and for this section. And it's just this middle section here that you can fudge around and play and that's not so important. And luckily, because it's knitwear, you've got so much more give and take than if you were doing it with um, <laughs> fabric. Here I am thinking, thank goodness, I don't, this doesn't concern me. And then I realise it's my arm she's talking about. Yeah, it really <laughs> concerns you. <laughs> you may need to learn how to do this. But some other time when it's quiet, you can go back. And obviously, you won't be able to follow my stitch counts, but that's the method. So you might need to go back and watch this a couple of times slowly, but that's how you can do it. Yeah. Okay, so coming up now is my trip to Maclay Island, and we start that with a short extreme stitching segment.
am presently on Maclay Island, a six kilometer long, four kilometer wide island at the southern end of Moreton Bay in Queensland, Australia. And I traveled up here to visit my sister Michaela, who's recently moved to the island. Yeah, it's great to have you finally here on the island. Yeah. So this island is a tropical island, which means that a lot of things grow on it. There is always insects talking to each other. We've got cicadas calling out to each other day and night. There's um, insects biting you all the time. There's geckos. <laughs> there's geckos running around on the walls. And there's lots of choruses of different birds, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. Magpies, kookaburras. Yeah. And I'm, I'm new blood, so I think I'm getting bitten extra. Anyway, you first met Michaela in our Maker segment back in episode 114, and she showed you how she teaches her classroom art students how to get inspiration on a subject and how to combine colours. And she did this through a painting project based on Australian architecture. So I've been really looking forward to catching up with Michaela again and sharing our arty and crafty interests. And I've convinced her to come back onto Fruity Knitting to show you some of the craft projects that she's done over the years, including a beautiful silk ribbon embroidery that she's only just finished designing. So in our last episode, where you first met our younger sister, Fiona, we briefly mentioned our grandmother who we called Mama. And Mama was a massive influence on both Michaela and I when we were growing up. And she yeah. was very much in our lives from the age of about five to 15, wasn't she? Yeah, yep. And Mama introduced us both to lots of different arts and crafts. And she really informed me and inspired me with my own craft making and also my career choices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And obviously she inspired me with knitting and hand spinning and... Totally. Yeah, yeah, all of that. So we're going to tell you a little bit more about Mama, some of the activities that she did with us when we were children, and also show you some photos of her because we think she was quite an exceptional woman. She was born in the year 1906 and she died one month before her 100th yeah. birthday. So these first photos are of Mama as a young woman and we've picked out photos where everything she's wearing she actually made herself, including the hat and the gloves, because directly after the Second World War, Mama was a war widow and she had to make kid leather gloves to support herself. And Mama's own mother, so our great-grandmother, was also an exceptional sewer, embroiderer and lace maker, and she made all the clothes for Mama and her brother when they were children, but she also made some really beautiful lace dresses for our own mother, as you can see in this photo here. So Mama and her second husband, who we called Papa, lived about an 18-hour drive away from our childhood home in Albury. And every year they would tow their caravan down to our house and camp in our driveway for about two months. And it was always such an exciting time because the caravan would be filled with lots of new crafting projects and activities that we would spend the next few weeks just exploring through and learning. So after Mama and Papa had stayed about three or four weeks with us, they would tow their caravan a further 1,500 kilometres right up to sunny Queensland to spend the Australian winter months because they really didn't like the cold weather. So the place where Mama and Papa stayed in Queensland during the winter months, there was a really strong crafting community there and Mama would be teaching hand spinning and knitting there, but she would also take every other available crafting course that was on offer. So that meant that when she came back down to Aubrey after the winter months, the caravan would be filled up again with lots of new materials and lots of new activities that she'd learned and techniques. So I just remember it as being such an exciting time when we would come home from school and we knew that that day Mama and Papa would have arrived and we come home and we see their caravan in, in the driveway and it's so exciting. Then we spend the next few days just, or weeks actually, just exploring through Mama's yeah. boxes and bags and just learning all these new activities, yeah, didn't we? Tell them about the plastic bags. Yeah, okay. So we both remember this particular activity. So really well. So Mama came home after one uh, winter feeling very excited about her latest discovery, which was crocheting very elaborate flamboyant hats and bags out of plastic bags. Now that doesn't sound that weird now, but we figured out that this would have happened about at least over 40 years ago. So we think around the year 1978 and nobody was thinking about recycling plastic bags then. No, and these were just very cheap supermarket bags yeah. cut up. 
Yeah, so she would cut them up and she would crochet very elaborate hat, hats and, and, and also bags and she would wear the hats on for the Melbourne Cup celebrations. So Melbourne Cup is a major Australian horse racing event and typically what happens is everybody gets dressed up and if you're in Melbourne you might go to the races but everywhere else around the nation you would just watch it on a big screen at a party yep. getting all dressed up and the women would wear flamboyant hats. So we've looked everywhere to try to see if we could find a photo of Mama, Mama in her plastic bag hats and we couldn't find no. one. But we did find a photo of Mama aged 96 when she was in the nursing home and she's looking really spiff in one of her other hat, homemade hats. So it's not a plastic bag hat, but it, it, it is a hat she's made herself. Unfortunately, this is a really bad photo, but you can see how Mama still loved to be glamorous and, and dress up. a beautiful pose with feathers. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, when Mama was in her 90s, she had another burst of energy and she ended up doing quite a lot of paintings, didn't she? She was just painting everything around her in a sort of a folk art way. With watercolours and acrylics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she was very busy. But I primarily remember her or think of her as an exceptional hand spinner and a very good knitter. And I don't really remember her knitting with commercial yarns. I only ever remember her knitting with her own hand spun yarn, which she would then dye from all the plants in her massive garden. So she would just use the typical plants, lots of different colored onion skins, walnut shells, mulberries, rhubarb leaves. She yeah. also did a really pretty green. We'll show you later, but this very pretty green, I can't remember what plant I do not she would have used. I remember what she used for that. For that, yeah. So, my, our own mother has got the majority of mama's knitwear, but Michaela did dig around and we found this very, very beautiful uh, fine lace cardigan that mama made. And we think she made it in the 50s or 60s. So it's, it's authentically retro. It's an extremely fine gauge and it's been lined with silk. I'm just gonna quickly put it on. You may not see it because it's light and, and um, so it's not the details of it aren't gonna show up but it's, it's very beautifully retro. And even the, the buttons have been crocheted. So you may not see that, but the buttons have got a crochet on them, but it's, it's, it's very gorgeous. <laughs> it comes into your waist really nicely too. It does, too. it does. It's actually a very special little heirloom, isn't it? To yeah. have of hers, that's great. Now in the very first fruity knitting episode I told you about the quilt of autumn leaves and that was the project that I learned to knit and hand sew on and Michaela has found hers because we did one each so let's show it. Yes. I'll hold it up. Mama had us both knit a bed quilt made of autumn leaves and each leaf is knitted individually and then sewn together. I still have this quilt from over 40 years ago and you can see it's quite a feat for a youngster to knit. So many of them weren't there. We, we, so many leaves, it went on for, for quite a long time yeah. but I mastered it down to maybe half an hour per leaf which I was feeling very proud of. <laughs> um, we both did our own versions of this and um, most of the leaves are knitted with commercial wool but there's still lots of the leaves that are knitted with mama's hand dyed yeah. natural experiments. And you can see these. This one too. This here. one as well. And and where is the green? There's a beautiful green. It's on the other side. Here. There. So I'll just quickly show you this. This is also been, this is hand dyed. I don't know what she used for this, but it's such a beautiful green, isn't it? She, she did the orange color too. That's pumpkin, don't you think? Or may, or it looks may. like it, but I have, I have no idea about that one. But these lighter ones, um, I know that she was using onion skins with some of them and, and walnuts. And, yeah. Yeah. So that's really <laughs> special. Okay, and then you did this also with Mama, didn't you? Yes. Um, yeah, I remember doing this embroidery with Mama. And um, I was very, very happy with... Actually, it was based off this book series. Uh, my favourite book series as a child called Swallows and Amazons. And I love the way I did the variations in the stitches around the bottom of the boat and all the glittery yarn. I'll hold it and you can point to it. And, um, and how Mama got me to do a blanket stitch around the inside of the border and we cut out and pulled out some of the weft and warp threads to give the lacy effect. How old do you think you were when you did this? Um, I was in primary school, so it must have been about 11. Yeah. yeah, so it's a little wall hanging. It's got a twig on the back. <laughs> 
It's very <laughs> rustic and it uses like a piece of old piece of hessian. Yeah. But it's gorgeous. And and I think at that time doing all of the sparkly yarn, that was a bit of a novelty, wasn't it? Yeah, that's like a bit of specialness. <laughs> okay, so, yep. so moving then, on. As a young adult, um, I studied textile design at RMIT and I then went to work in the bed linen com- in a bed linen industry. So I'm just trying to get this massive quilt in a position where you can see the majority of the print on it. Yeah, my job was designing and painting the images that got printed onto bed linen. And our company designed for the lower to middle end of the market, which was ideal for busy all over prints, which I really loved doing. Is that because the the fabric wasn't high end? Yeah, the fabric's not high end. So low end fabric can afford, you know, you can get away with low end fabric by having just covered with images and prints. So it's perfect for a print designer. This is an example of one that I did as a special edition um, for an Australian um, celebration. And it had bicentenary, to be, wasn't it? I think it was the bicentenary. It was over 20 years ago. And it had to be um, all Australiana in theme. So I've got Uluru at the top, the Central Desert, and moving down to Kakadu, which is northern Australia, with deep ravines and lagoons. And then platypus here. You yep. may not see that. Possum, ring-tailed possum. Yeah, lots of different Australian animals and fauna. We've got tree frogs as well. We don't have a kookaburra, do we? We don't have a kookaburra, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, but parakeets. Little kangaroos and there's, there's um, kangaroo paw, which is a very unusual flower as yeah. well, and the little tree frogs. Okay. Um, so whilst I was an adult, um, oh, sorry, whilst I've been teaching art and design for many years, I was still kept up with my crafting so I've got some examples here of different bags that I've made and this bag I've used recycled um, jeans yes there's a there's a pocket a back pocket yeah you can see um, the bum pocket on the back and I've contrasted it with different florals on the inside and outside and then I've done a little satin stitch embroidery down the side inspired by Mexican folk art and you've got another orangey material in here, haven't yeah, you? Yeah. This I is had... a cool but so that wasn't part of the jeans. No, that's just different fabrics that I've added there. And yeah. there's quite a bit of effort in all the sewing and the zips and the padding on the, the Yeah, bottom. you've got a little zip in here as well. Yeah, and this was another bag that I did which just used very high contrasting colours. So and, you've got yellow inside. And patterns. Yeah. That's so, cool. Very colourful. Very colourful. Hafe was a major inspiration, I can see. I absolutely loved his work when I was studying at textile design at RMIT. He, we just thought he was exceptional. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, so then I went on and I, um, sometime later, and I started making this king size bed quilt. And I've, I'm probably halfway through, but the panels are still all separate. And um, this quilt design was by Monica Poole, and it's a quilt-as-you-go sampler quilt. Um, So what's quilt-as-you-go? Well, it means that you can do the panels separately and then do the stitching over the top on your domestic machine, whereas if you... um, Some ways of doing quilts, you would sew all the bits together and then send it away for a big commercial machine to do all the -the over-the-top stitching. So all these panels have different stitching that's done over the top yeah here's a wavy stitch yep and Um, this one's more of a diagonals and crisscrossing and then this one's like an applique stitch yeah and so yeah this um quilt design really lent itself to high contrasting patterns and high contrasting um colors and i am so in love with reds and greens and so i've got a color palette here i can kind of show you I took colours that were... I'll hold it like this. Yeah, yep. so I took colours that were um, either reds or lighter versions or colours either side, and then I went down to the greens and, and did greeny colours and either side, lights and darks. I added splashes of yellow as well to um, kind of make it pop, and I'm going to be sewing um, little strips of this around the edges to join all the borders, and then it'll have a nice bright chartreuse yellow border at the top and bottom. My nail polish is going very well. With this patch. <laughs> Actually, I, I go very well with it. 
You do, and With my this purple. is your greens. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, the, the effect is really dramatic and high contrast in colours and patterns and a clashy busyness, which is fun. And this lovely coral pink. Yeah, I love It's all actually these all colors. my colours. It is. I love your colours. I would look very good. <laughs> well, I love them too. <laughs> so um, while okay. we're talking about partially finished quilts, I'll um, show you another one that Mama both started. Well, she started it, but she didn't complete it. She told me what her plans were, but she was getting past embroidery at the age of 96. Yeah. So she, Mama had used many of the same size pieces of calico and she'd embroidered it with white embroidery thread onto the calico. I'm going to have to put photos over this because I'm sure you can't see the detail of the embroidery here, but each one has a different picture on it. It does. Well, Mama collected all her um, images and then she traced them onto tracing paper with a transfer um, pink pen and then she would iron that onto the calico yeah. so the design would come out. Yeah, and then she used mostly three different stitches. She used um, French knots, uh, a chain stitch, and in some areas where she wanted to emphasise part of the pattern, she did a satin stitch. Yeah, I, I really love Mama's choice of calico and her timeless colour palette of white on white. She had a really modern taste for someone who was almost 100. And my plan is to complete this quilt as well as this one, but this one in memory of my darling grandmother. I'll show you now my most recent embroidery that I've both designed and created. This embroidery is based off a plant portrait image that I've created using an art technique called scanography. I'll I've hold got, them up for you. Yeah, yeah, I've got some of my scanographic prints here to show you. Um, with this technique, I've used a flatbed scanner to capture an image of the plant. And I'm able to create really striking areas of high contrast, light and dark. And some areas are really clear in focus and some areas are a lot more blurred. So they look like they're emerging out of the dark. I, I think they look like they're swimming in underwater. It's like as if you've gone deep sea or deep lock diving and you're shining yeah. a torch on this plant and you just see yeah. it swimming in the darkness. And this one actually has coral in it and some seaweeds that were kind of washed up when I was walking along the coast one day. This is a nice bright one as well. Yeah, I developed this technique about 10 years ago and I've used it a lot to produce different artworks. I've done oil paintings with these designs and I've printed them on photo paper or even greeting cards and um, I've yeah, even printed like them on um, different materials. So this one is printed on aluminium. It's kind of a matte surface, so it's, I really like the effect. It, it doesn't reflect too much. And um, I've used lots of different plants that I collect and grow, and I love this one of the ornamental cabbages. So can you eat an ornamental cabbage, or is it just like a rose cabbage for um, decoration? I actually got these ones from a flower shop. Like while I grow red cabbages, these are a little bit more frilly and probably a little bit prettier. So you probably can eat them, but I've never tried. <laughs> That's the long answer. Yeah. Okay, and this one you based your embroidery on. I did. Um, this one's called sun-dried paper flowers. And this is my favourite. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Um, I collected these from sand dunes when I was walking along the coast, kind of at the end of summer. And I've used stems like this stem and the centre stem and the right one. And I did a, like a really simplified line drawing to come oh, yeah. up with the design. That's it there. So you can see clearly if you hold it next to it. Yeah. yeah. So I've just okay. had to simplify it right down to use this as the basis of the embroidery design. Yeah, so clearly that's that. This one's here and there. Yeah. Yeah, this is beautiful. It's very simple. I traced the line drawing onto tissue paper and then pinned the tissue paper onto the wool felt backing. Using a small tacking stitch, I've sewn along the lines to transfer the design to the felt as it's not possible to use a transfer pen onto textured felt. It's a really great method for using on dark fabrics and it's also very easy to pull out any stitches that show through at the end. I've used four main stitches in this embroidery. With the embroidery thread, I used satin stitch which has some long and short stitches for the flower buds on the right hand stem 
and the petals on the centre. I used a couching stitch for all of the flower stems. For the 3D effect on the stems, I laid down gimp on the felt and I couched it with sewing thread first to hold the gimp while stitching. I then used different coloured embroidery threads to couch the stems. With the ribbon, I've used a few different ribbon stitches. On this first stem, I've used sets of two or three overlapping ribbon stitches to create a windblown, sun-dried flower effect. With the centre stem on the rose centres or the flower centres, I've used a stitch called Spiderweb Rose. And this is a really fun stitch. You, you get to stitch five stitches radiating out from the center and then you bring the ribbon up through the center and you weave it over and under, over and under, going right around till you've gone to the outside. The effect is great because you can change the ribbon color and you can use all of a dark ribbon in one area or another flower might have a dark center with a light on the outside or vice versa. And you get these lovely 3D petal effects with the ribbon as you twist it. So I've also done two colorways with this. This colorway is called Lily Pilly. And Lily Pilly is the main na name of the ribbon thread that I've used, this one here, this ribbon and this thread. And Lily Pilly is also the name of an Australian native bush that has Lily Pilly berries. You can eat them. You've got one in your garden, but it only flowered with one berry. <laughs> yeah, I so we can't show you. <laughs> they were actually eaten by somebody and there's only one or two left. <laughs> um, but this colour scheme just has lots of lovely raspberries and reds and the different greens to contrast with it. I like this one the most, actually. And the other colour scheme that I've developed is called Kookaburra. And Kookaburra is the name of the main ribbon colour that I've used, which is this one here. And it's got its golds and browns in it. And we've got also some rust and beiges in this colour scheme. And Kookaburra is a really famous Australian bird. Very well known. It's, it's actually probably my favourite bird. It's got an amazing laugh and you've got a ton of kookaburras around here. So you get a chorus every morning and a chorus every evening. And so we've recorded it just so that you can hear what they sound like. They're so amazing. They remind me of really raucous old men having uh, too many pints of beer and just sort of laughing away. They're very cute looking birds and they've got quite a strong marking underneath the eye, which makes them look really cheeky, don't they? Yeah. Yep. And um, it's very catching, their laughter. It sort of just makes you want to join in. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's really satisfying um, painting with colour and using the variegated hand dyed um, threads and ribbons like yeah. these two here I love how how many different colors they've got in them a, a lot of these variegated threads have three to four different colors and you get fun surprises as you're stitching just seeing where a particular color will appear and you can also um, I would play around with that sometimes when I'm cutting it up and go I really want that dark green to appear here or I want a, a pink to appear there so that's that's the fun bit. Yeah, it's like variegated knitting yarns. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that's a bit of my art and craft journey, which all started off with Mama. Yeah. yeah. So Mama's the major inspiration. So while Mama was a, um, you know, amazing spinner and knitter, it was really her flexibility and enthusiasm for exploring lots of different arts and crafts that impacted me the most. And... Yeah, I feel like I've really taken after her that way. Yeah, and actually when you do one craft, it's very easy to transfer the skills that you've learned in that craft over to all the other different ones. Your eye becomes to, uh, more attuned at seeing things and, and your fingers are, are more used to yeah. manoeuvring things. Yes, yeah. the skills are really transferable. So thank you for spending some time again on Fruity Knitting. <laughs> it was fun getting these all out and getting re-inspired yeah yeah okay so and I hope you enjoyed those scenes of Maclay Island to start off with so I got the the drone out and Bruce Michaela's partner came out and helped me help keep an eye on the drone that it wasn't going too far away so we'll say goodbye now and thanks for being with us bye <laughs>
Welcome back. I was really impressed with Michaela's silk ribbon embroidery paper flowers. It was yeah. beautiful. I particularly love the spiderweb stitch because it's so intricate, but you can see that it's actually pretty easy. You've got your five long loops out like a, a bit of a star, and then you've got your variegated silk ribbon, and you're just weaving it in and out around and around these long loops. And then at the end, you get this gorgeous, intricate rose. And I was just thinking where you might use that in knitting. And I thought, obviously, if you're into vintage garments, and I hope you like my vintage dress. It's gorgeous. <laughs> you may not see this up closely, but it's got really beautiful vintage pictures of it, of women swimming in the sea. It's I really just gorgeous. need to take you out now. You do. Well, you need to go out and party after this. <laughs> anyway, if you're into knitting vintage uh, cardigans and garments I could easily imagine a formation of those roses just on a little collar here or down the button bands of a cardigan or around a yoke mm. that would look really gorgeous so I think I might actually get some of those variegated uh, hand dyed ribbons and just have, keep that in mind use your patron discount yes <laughs> <laughs> I really loved Michaela's kookaburra colorway to me, that's yeah. really vintage colours, and I think it would look very nice somewhere around here. Yes, it does. Future, future gift idea, Michaela. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, where do you, how else do you think you could use the paper flowers embroidery other than it being a picture? Because it is beautiful as a picture. Mm. But Cushions? Yeah. Or maybe a table runner or a bed runner as well. Yeah. A little purse or a clutch. That would look really elegant. Yeah, a clutch. clutch would be really good. If it was going to be a cushion, it would sort of have to be a feature cushion yeah. because you'd hate to be... Actually not allowed to bunch it up and squash it behind you. No. Neck. It's just to be admired. Yeah. <laughs> Don't touch. <laughs> just look. Okay. So... Maclay Island is a really tiny island and the population is really only, I think, around between three and 4,000 people, but it does have a very vibrant arts community and there's also a thriving textile business on the island called Colour Streams and Michaela made friends with the owner of Colour Streams, Chris Nosk, and it was Chris, Chris who encouraged Michaela to get back into embroidery and design a kit for Colour Streams customers which is really good so that was the motivation behind her doing it so color streams is kindly offering fruity knitting patrons a 15 percent discount off everything in her online store and the discount of course also includes all the materials in the pattern for both colorways for michaela's embroidery which by the way is very suitable for beginners she assures us and apart from being my sister i just know that she's an excellent teacher so i can say that her instructions will be really clear and easy to follow and Colour Streams produces beautiful hand-dyed, hand-painted threads, including silks, cottons, specialty threads, and fabrics from felt through to linen, velvets, and scrim. I wonder what scrim is. It sounds interesting. <laughs> Chris says that her products are only limited in their use by your imagination, and she has seen them used everywhere, from dreadlock jewellery to wedding invitations and weaving as well as traditional embroidery and stitching. So thanks very much to Colour Streams. I'd like to remind our viewers that producing fruity knitting is my full-time job. It might look like I'm on holiday here in Australia while I'm staying with my family, but I am still working full-time. I barely ever see her. <laughs> it does take many hours of research, preparation and filming to produce a high-quality, content-rich program. And we are totally reliant on the financial support of our patrons to keep producing the show. So we do ask that if you are watching to please support our work by becoming a patron. There's a link here on the screen. There's a live link in the description box below. And you can pick a level of support that suits your income. So we really thank you for doing that. And we're particularly thankful and grateful to the wonderful patrons who have enabled the show to keep going so far. So... Let's get on to under construction with your new project. I'm working on another Kim Hargraves design. And yes, I'm entering it into the Kim Hargraves knit along, which Andrea started last episode. You did that purely to please me, didn't I you? I did. So I hope you're pleased. <laughs> I am. <laughs> Actually, you didn't put a time limit on it, did you? No, so I didn't. maybe I can pull off my grand idea of 12 designs of Kim in 12 months. Though realistically, it will be more like 24 or 36. A year, we could, I could manage a year of Kim Hargraves. I don't know about three years of Kim Hargraves. <laughs> Let me show you a picture of my current design. 
It's called Icy and it's from her winter book. Andrea brought the book with her from Germany, so I was bound to choose something from it as well. I fell in love with the oversized cropped look and, of course, those early 90s bobbles. They are gorgeous. <laughs> the pattern is written for two different types of yarn, either the Rowan Merino Aria, which is a smooth yarn and gives the bobbles a lot of definition, or the Rowan Brushed Fleece, which creates a much softer look. Pass them over. Let's have a look. I'm using a different yarn altogether. It's the Deririm Natura Serrano, which is also a chunk, chunky weight, and the label says it's a French and Portuguese merino produced in France in an eco-friendly manner. The yarn has a very rounded structure with five plies, so it's perfect for showing off cables, texture, or in my case, bubbles galore. <laughs> I'm a bit worried about looking like a powder blue porcupine, or else like I've got some kind of noxious, infectious disease. Yeah, it is pretty full on. <laughs> You need to taper it down with some conservative clothes underneath, I think. Okay. Yeah. White we'll shirt and blue jeans. It's risky, but we'll see. <laughs> the Serrano comes in the most beautiful range of 24 sophisticated and heathered colours. Yeah. And I've chosen the powder blue, which is called Seal. I was going for the baby pink, but Andrea talked me down from the ledge and convinced me to try something new with blue. I can't believe it. She says blue's out of her comfort zone. Look how gorgeous she looks in it. Well, I do love the colour. I just barely ever wear blue. Well, look, it goes with my new dress. That's true. <laughs> and, well, I'm not sure exactly what to pair it with, and I don't – I'm not a denim girl. So Andrea I, did tell me it's an excuse to buy a new wardrobe. Definitely. I'll help you out there. <laughs> Isn't she naughty? <laughs> The cardigan is knitted in pieces from the bottom up, so I'm feeling much more confident about interpreting this traditional Rowan pattern after my experience with the Devote. Yeah. Uh, I still am using my longhand pattern rewrite method, though, but I've managed to use fewer pages, so I must be improving. Yeah, yeah. It's beautiful, and your knitting is very neat. Well, Andrea says it's a mindless knit. I wish I had her mind because I've had to rip back way too many times because of silly mistakes, one of which I swear was the pattern's mistake. And I bet that's a very <laughs> typical beginner thing to say. <laughs> to say that it's a pattern mistake. Well, sometimes it can be the pattern mistake, the pattern's mistake. You just have to sort of know. Like I, I would have to say with Alistair Moore, I know that it's almost impossible to find a mistake in her patterns. Mm. And so if it really looks like there's a mistake – I have to think, no, it's my mistake, and reread it five times. <laughs> well, I'm too scared to write it up on Ravelry that there's a mistake here in case I just get absolutely not. Hammered. <laughs> yeah, hammered. Okay, so the cardigan's knitted with 7 millimeter needles, which at first I was very excited about, thinking it would be a quick knit, but now I'm less so. The thing is, 7 mils is actually really clunky and awkward to knit with. Yeah, I've been telling you that. <laughs> Especially coming off the back of the smooth sailing 3.75s or 4.5s. Now I know why you don't have anything above 4.5 in your own stash. I know, she thought I was a needle snob. <laughs> now I see she's on to something. The pattern works. A few rows of stockinette stitch followed by a row of bobble making. I'm zipping along until I get to the bobbles and then I'm tightly and awkwardly trying to knit one, purl one, knit one, purl one, knit one into the same stitch. And I just think there must be a more efficient way of creating a bubble. Just practice. It's really just practice. And and with finer needles, it's easier. You're right. Everything is much more clunkier. I'll have to take your word for it. Yes. <laughs> I had hoped to have finished the cardigan by today, but alas, the bubbles have slowed me down. Yeah. Blame it on the bubbles. They <laughs> are cute though. You'll look like a cute porcupine. Well, you can be the verdict, <laughs> the judge in the next episode yeah. yeah okay so it's actually time now for our feature interview where madeline is interviewing daniela dean the gold work embroiderist and costume maker extraordinaire as i said earlier i feel so privileged to be able to present such exquisite work on fruity knitting so i think you'll really enjoy it and gold work embroidery has got such an interesting history it dates back at least a thousand years in western culture and some people think over two thousand years in asian culture and i think once you learn just a little bit about it it changes the way you look at historical textiles whether you see them in a museum or you just see paintings and you can start Start sort of interpreting and understanding what's drawn on these these old costumes and things. So 
I think you should really enjoy it. And actually, I think that after seeing the interview, there'll be a few of you who will be really tempted to try doing some gold work embroidery yourself. If that's the case, you're in luck because Daniela has some very comprehensive online tutorials on her website where she teaches you all of the traditional techniques. And the projects that you'll be working on as you're learning these techniques look so professional and just really, really beautiful, but she assures us that they're suitable for beginners. So if you can thread a needle, most of us can. You were having trouble the other day. Sailor mouth was making an appearance. <laughs> Again, <laughs> with your buttonholes. But if most of us, and I think we can unless you need bifocals like me, thread a needle, you can try Daniela's gold work tutorials, which is really exciting. And Daniela is offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 20% discount on all her kits and courses and Daniela's 15 step-by-step -step tutorials aim at giving you an in-depth guide to traditional goldwork techniques, including string and felt padding, kid leather, ribbon plate, broad plate, cut work over string, cut work chips and couching techniques. They sound so professional, <laughs> don't they? And following the tutorials, you can then complete four mini projects and the kits for the projects are available separately on her website and contain everything you'll need to complete each project. So all the details for the kits, the courses and the discounts, as usual, are in the program notes over at fruitingknitting.com. So time for us to say goodbye, enjoy the interview and don't forget to watch to the very, very end to see what the bush fairies are up to because they're doing a new craft. Thanks for spending time with us and we'll see you as soon as we can. Yes. Bye. Bye. Welcome to Fruity Knitting. My guest today is Danielle Dean. Danielle is a professional costume maker who specializes in the ancient and highly skilled craft of goldwork embroidery. This is going to be an exciting interview. As you can see, I get to wear a gorgeous 1940s dress that Danielle recreated for a TV documentary. And we also have some more costumes that Danielle made that she will show us and talk about later on. So Danielle, thank you for coming on Fruity Knitting. It's a pleasure. So you are a professional costume maker and you specialize in gold work embroidery. What kind of work have you done as a costume maker? So I've had a really varied career in costume. Um, I've worked in film, television, mm -hmm. theater, lots of interesting projects. I created the costumes for uh, the lead actress Sheridan Smith when she starred in a remake of Funny Girl mm -hmm. that was at the West End in London. Um, also in the West End in London, I made the costumes for The Lion King. Uh -huh. So that was really interesting. That was kind of making the headwear and the masks that are worn. So that involved a lot of hand sewing, beading, um, also some leather work in that. So that was quite different as well. Yeah. I've also worked in film, lots of different films. I worked on a film called Gold, which was set in 1948. So that needed a lot of historical research to mm -hmm. ensure that all of the costumes were correct mm -hmm. for that period. Very different things. I've worked on the London 2012 Olympics. So as part of the costume team for the opening ceremonies. Right. 
Um, that was quite a task. Between us, we made over 26,000 costumes for That's that. That's amazing. So, yeah, it was fascinating. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Must have been a lot of work. Yeah. And what training have you done to become a professional costume maker? Could you maybe show us some examples of your work as well? Yeah, sure. So I completed a costume interpretation degree at Wimbledon University. So it's a really prestigious university. It's part of the University of the Arts London. Um, so it's with Central St. Martins and the London College of Fashion. So the costume course, uh, the spaces are very limited on the costume course. So I was very lucky to complete that degree. Yeah. And the reason I chose that degree was within costume interpretation, you get a really varied education in costume. So you, you specialize in lots of different areas. So for example, I studied tailoring at Savile Row, pattern cutting, dyeing, hand dyeing, uh, embellishment. So I always specialised in hand embroidery and yeah. um, particularly enjoyed the gold work embroidery. Yeah. So I'm going to show you some costumes today. Yes. Yeah, so they're quite different. Shall we start um, with this one here? Yeah, so this one is a theatre costume. So for theatre, you would approach um, the making of a costume with quite a different angle because the costume needs to be worn for a long theatre run. Mm -hmm. So... There are different elements to this costume. Um, you can see on the front panel there's a lot of hand, em of hand embroidery, um, but this is detachable so that the costume can be laundered after the performance. Yeah. It's really I imagine important. that's very really important. <laughs> yes. yes. And again, the gilet is removable so the costume can be cleaned. Um, this costume is from an opera, Mozart's Seraglio Opera. Mm -hmm. So the character for this costume was a young prince who would have been living in the palace of the Ottoman Empire. So it came from a sketch that was created by a costume designer. So that's quite a challenge when the designer has created just a sketch from their imagination. Yeah. So yeah. this it's, it's quite difficult to kind of interpret their ideas. So it involved a little bit of historical research, trying to get the colours that were reminiscent of the era and the the area where the costume was from. Yeah. Well, it's really beautiful. Can you tell us about some of the details here? Yeah, so we've got the hand embroidery on the front panels. Again, it kind of captures that essence of the, the, the Ottoman Empire at the time. And then the, the silk gilet is a raw silk gilet. And it's padded with some machine embroidery. That was quite a tricky um, task to keep the stitching in a straight line, but it gives a really nice effect, especially from on stage. Yeah. Um, for yeah. the for the audience. Um, so yeah, that's that was a theatre costume. And then the other costume I'm going to show you is the the one I'm wearing. The one you're right wearing. Now, yes. yes, the dress you're wearing. So this dress. I created this dress for a documentary on the fashion designer Elsa Schiaparelli. She's actually my favourite designer. And this dress she, Elsa Schiaparelli created in 1940. Um, so it's a classic 1940s style, really simple, elegant dress. And Elsa actually donated this dress to the Victorian Albert Museum. And it's still shown there today. You can still pop along and see the dress there mm -hmm. today. So she donated that just after she retired. So to create this dress, I used a pattern that was featured in a book called Patterns of Fashion by an author called Janet Arnold. So I'm just going to take this opportunity to show you these books um, because they are so amazing. They are really valuable to the costume society. Mm -hmm. So Janet Arnold was a fashion historian. She was born in 1932. She lived till 1998 and she mm -hmm. dedicated her whole life to the history of fashion. She documented so much information that has been so useful for fashion students. So real treasures then. Oh, she just left a legacy, so yeah. we are really grateful of that. I can show you the content of the books in some detail here. So you can see that she talks about so many different elements of costume through history, um, lots of different designs in there. Is this book for a specific era? Yeah, she covers different eras at the times. Um, this is the Tudor and Stuart period. And you can see she even hand sketches That's amazing. the designs and leaves the actual patterns so things can be recreated. This design especially is a Tudor uh, costume and I did create this one myself. Um, he's wearing a leather doublet. And again, she's she's given all the details of the design, how that's made. Um, so that was one that I recreated. So these books are really 
fantastic for costume and, yeah. and fashion history. Yeah, so the next stage with the dress, um, following the construction, so as we said, it's a typical 1940s dress, really simple silhouette, really beautiful. It's and gorgeous. It's <laughs> it very comfortable you. as well. <laughs> <laughs> so the next stage was the embellishment on the front. So the original dress w- was embellished by a very famous hand embroidery emporium called Lesage mm-hmm. in Paris. So they would have created the original. They also created embellishment on a lot of couture dresses for the likes of Christian Dior and Chanel. Um, so they've been around for a long time. Mm-hmm. I also did some um, some embroidery for a fashion house, a British fashion house oh, called okay. Ralph and Rousseau. Yeah. Um, it was really amazing to make some dresses for the likes of Angelina Jolie. Things... That must have been so exciting. Yeah, she wore them on the red carpet yeah. and... Meghan Markle wore one of her dresses for her engagement announcement. Yeah. So, yeah, it was really wonderful to work there. Quite nerve-wracking to make. I'm sure, I'm sure. Those kind of things, and yeah. could you tell us what kind of techniques you used on, on the embroidery here? I see there's some padding underneath the gold work embroidery. Yeah, yeah, it's typical to pad out the gold work embroidery. And this is the gold plate. And this is like a crimped gold plate to give the stems of the flowers. Mm-hmm. And then also, this is different, this is seed pearls. Um, so they're hand stitched onto the dress there. There's so many of them. <laughs> that must be such patient work. <laughs> yeah, takes a while. Yeah. yeah. It's very beautiful. And I've also got a very deep back behind me. I'm sure Mum will show it in a photo. It's a really elegant shape on the dress. You've got a nice deep low V back here with two gathers. So it's very simple, but a really elegant design. Yeah. And goldwork embroidery is your specialty. So tell us why you love it so much. And also say a little bit about its historical background and use. Yeah, so there's a number of reasons why I love goldwork embroidery. Um, I think the first one is the actual threads themselves. The metal threads just catch the light so beautifully and they're really nice to work with. And also the other reason is the history of gold work. Um, There's Mm. such a strong history behind this technique. If we look back in time, we can see examples of gold work through many different countries, different cultures. So it's really quite fascinating to look back on that. They do believe it may be originated in the Far East and it travelled across to the West in the Silk Road. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's how it came to be here. In Here in the UK, we have some examples of very early gold work. It was related to the church and specifically ah, yes, St. Yeah. Cuthbert. Um, the examples of those are held at Durham Cathedral and they date back to the 10th century. That's amazing. Um, so there's quite a lot of history in this technique and that's what I, I really love about yeah, that. Yeah. And of course, we see it in different places. Also, the monarchs are... <laughs> often wear the gold work embroidery um queen elizabeth um she had a really large garment um what was it for her the coronation coronation. that's right yes gold work embroidery oh yeah so that's really interesting the royal school of needlework they are they were commissioned to complete the design and the embroidery on the coronation gown both for queen elizabeth and the queen mother yeah um they chose different designs queen elizabeth chose some barley ears and some wheat sheaves and it was representative of peace and prosperity Uh because we just come out of the second world war so it was quite this is what I love about gold work it it tells a story it's a tapestry of history so it's really interesting to see that and what about modern days nowadays where do you find gold work embroidery apart from the monarchs I'm sure they still like to use it yeah we see it a lot in the military um Mm -hmm. it's also seen quite a lot in the military to show the rank of an officer and the status of an officer so it often shows power and wealth in yeah, that way yeah. so you see it a lot in in the forces yeah well we have a collection of beautiful gold threads in front of us right now and i would like you to tell us a bit about them and also show us some different gold work embroidery techniques yeah of course so in the beginning, a lot of the metalwork embroidery was a silver gilt thread. And as you can imagine, that was a high silver content mm. and quite costly. So nowadays we have um, different alternatives, which are a bit more affordable. So I'm going to just show you a few different examples. One of the most popular threads that I used in goldwork embroidery is the Japanese thread. So this is a reel of the Japanese thread. This is an imitation jap, so it's got a really low content of gold. Okay. And... Basically, this is made in Japan and it would be a gold leaf that's applied 
in strips around either a silk cotton, a silk thread core or a synthetic core. So this okay. one is um, the modern version of that, basically. And yes, you can see if I, I can pull this apart and you can see it's a metallized um, wrap around a synthetic core. Yeah. So that, that makes the gold thread. And sort of within gold work, there's, there's two types of thread. There's the one that's wrapped around the core and then there's another one that's hollow in the center. Okay, how do you do that? So these are the ones that are hollow in the center. So these are called pearl threads. Um, the pearl name comes from the way the threads are created. So basically this is an actual metal wire. So there's there's no core thread in this one. Yeah. And the metal wire is wound around a needle to give it a hollow center. So when working with the pearl threads, you would pass your sewing needle through the center of those and attach them almost like a bead. So That must be an incredibly thin um, thin needle though. Yeah, you do need to use a thin needle, yes. And size nine or ten needle is really thin and I'll be able to show you that a bit later on. Yeah. So these ones, this one here, this one's really beautiful. So this is a Czech pearl. So again, it's created in the same way as this pearl, but it's coiled around a three-sided needle, which gives it this, ah, it gives right. it a check yeah. effect. Yeah. Um, so it's really, really interesting the way these are created um, and the way they're used. So it catches the light a lot more. Yeah, definitely. The bright okay. check will catch yeah. the light. It's stunning. Yeah, you kind of have a smooth and a rough um, pearl. And so you can see this one is the rough pearl, which is a bit more matte. It just means the metal has been dulled down a little bit okay. it's not as bright as the check yeah um yeah so they're really interesting this is the broad plate and um, this is one of my favorites to work with um here i've got it in this beautiful copper color yeah um this is really one of the tricky ones to work with um because you would bend this wire back and forth to fill in a, a space in a design mm -hmm. but unfortunately once you've bent it you can't unbend it and it it's quite okay. fragile. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it can snap at times. So you've kind of got to know what you're doing with that one. But it's, it, it gives a beautiful effect. It's really nice. Um, and we've also got, we're spoilt for choice now with modern threads. Mm -hmm. um, we've got some amazing colours in the metal threads. So that also looks like a pearl to me, right? Yep, that's a pearl, yeah. Very. Was there even several pearls, like two pearls wrapped yeah. around yeah. another you needle can see, as You well. can see the two different colours of the pearl. And they're wow. entwined around each yeah, other. Yeah. And they're just beautiful. They give such a gorgeous effect. Do you ever thread them onto anything if they're hollow in the middle? Or do you just tend to sew them down onto the material? Yeah, so there's different ways. So you would, you as we just explained, you would sew down, you would cut the length you need of the pearl and sew it to your design. Um, with the other threads, the Japanese thread, they are couched to the surface. So that's the technique for that. Mm -hmm. And they're usually couched in pairs. And the reason we do the couching stitch is it's a very small stitch to just anchor the gold to the fabric. Obviously, with gold, you want most of the gold on the surface. Yes, because cause it's so expensive. It's so expensive. Yeah. It's so beautiful. And it yeah. wants to be the main feature of your design. So you just use a small couching stitch to keep that in, in probably a gold colored thread to okay. be um, inconspicuous other, yeah. other than if you want it to be part of the design. Yeah. Um, so that's really nice with the modern threads. Um, we have a company in the UK called Benton and Johnson who make these threads. Um, they've been around for a very long time in London. Mm -hmm. and they did move to the Midlands in about the 1990s. And they are a fascinating, fascinating factory. They've got um, staff there that are creating these threads in exactly the way they've been doing it for a long time using the original machinery. All right, all right. Yeah. And they, they also produce modern threads as well? Or do yeah. They, okay. yeah, they produce the modern threads as well. Um, they do believe that they are, the, the people who work there are due for retirement, so I do hope a new generation of workers will take on mm. this, this you know, production of these threads just to keep this lovely handcraft yeah, continuing. Yeah, it's, it's extremely niche. You've got to get the young people to... Get an interest into these beautiful techniques. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. Well, in 2014, you were asked to create an authentic Tudor attire, which you can see right next to you right now, mm -hmm. uh, for an exhibition called In Fine Style at the Queen's Gallery, Gallery in Buckingham Palace. So that must have been a highlight in your career. Could you take us through your process of creating such an ambitious project? 
Yeah, so this was obviously a highlight of my career. It was absolutely amazing to be asked to take part in this. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so first thing was to research the painting that I was given to to find out more about the attire. Mm -hmm. So the actual painting was created by Robert Peake in 1605, and it was depicting a young Prince of Wales, Prince Henry, the Prince of Wales at the time. Um, I was really, really fortunate because... The artefacts in the Queen's Gallery are private to the Queen, obviously, and they were um, in storage at the time, but the painting by Robert Peake was hanging in the National Portrait Gallery. So you got to visit it in person? Yeah, that was okay. really amazing. So I went to the National Portrait Gallery to have a look at the painting, Yeah, and I was quite taken aback by the size of it. It was over six feet tall, wow. the painting, but it was yeah. brilliant because I got to see so much detail. Yeah. So I was able to take a sketchbook and to actually sketch this gold work design um, from the painting That's itself. That's beautiful. Yeah, so the next stage after looking at the painting was to look for some historical reference on the garment itself. Um, so they have a log of a royal tailor at the time who was commissioned to make a riding outfit in, okay. in a green woolen cloth. Um, so we do think that this was the outfit at that time. So this was actually a riding outfit. And you had access to the bookkeeping. Yes, yeah, so we could see we could see that was purchased for this garment. And Prince Henry, he was the son of James I and Anne of Denmark, and he was a really flamboyant character. So he had a real love for fashion. He loved the Italian fashion of the right. time, music, art. He was um, really vivacious. So it seemed quite apt that he would commission an outfit like this mm -hmm. and even though it's it's a riding outfit but the male the males of the royal palace were often riding or hunting so obviously for royalty they would want to be wearing something to show them in all their splendor mm, yeah um so this is this is definitely kind of the historical background on that which enabled me to choose the right fabrics um to make the garment so again i reference the patterns in the patterns of fashion books by Janet Arnold. Mm -hmm. So she she documents a pattern for a doublet and breeches. So here is he would be wearing traditional breeches and the doublet. Um, so I was able to cut that out in the in the green woolen fabric. Now I also placed a layer over the top of a gold organza and the reason I did that was because in the actual painting, it's not a flat gold, uh, green colour. Yeah, it's got okay. like a slight gold shimmer to it. Yeah. So I made the decision to use that because it just, it related to the painting a lot more. And obviously when this was shown next to the painting, it just looked more authentic yeah, at the so time. Yeah, so you really look out for the details and every resource you can find. Yeah, yeah. There was a lot of hours in this costume. I'm and sure. A lot of research for it to, 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 get, to get it right, basically. So after you found the the fabrics that you were going to use, what did what came next? So yeah, the construction of the garment. Um, this was hand stitched because obviously sewing machines weren't invented mm -hmm. <laughs> at that time. So everything is created as it would have been in sixteen oh five. Wow! So even the inside of this doublet is quilted by hand with lamb's wool, exactly okay. how it would have been yeah. in that time. Um, the lace detail on the collar and cuffs was applied, and then. Obviously, the best part was the gold work for me. Yeah. Um, many hours <laughs> creating the intricate gold work. Um, again, using the techniques we've just talked about here. So you can see an example of the Jap thread couch down in pairs here. Mm -hmm. Some of this is the pearl over the padding. Yeah, so the okay. individual pieces of the pearl are sewn down there. There's gold, gold braid on this. So there's lots of different techniques. The gold plate... Um, as it would have been authentically back then. And this seems rather matte. It doesn't seem super shiny like, for example, yeah. the, this checkered yeah. Yeah. one that you showed us. Yeah, I did a process um, in costume. We learned um, about breaking down costumes as well. So right. obviously for this to be authentic of the Tudor period, over 400 years old, I didn't want it to have this bright finish. So I did use a technique to kind of dull the gold slightly. Okay. Um, just yeah. using a, a slightly mild abrasive to kind of tarnish the gold. But I think it's really nice because it gives it that historic feel yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was wonderful when that was on it, on display next to the painting. 
Well, it's really beautiful. I'm sure you were very proud. And what happens now with the costume? Because the exhibition is done, of course. Yeah. So this has travelled all over the country. Um, it's been loaned out to museums to kind of show the fashion of the Tudor period. Yeah. And it's also been used as a teaching aid. Um, a lot of students have, have referenced this for the patterns and also for the gold work. Yeah. Well, it's amazing. Thank you for showing it to us. Um, and how can interested viewers get started on their own gold work embroidery if they want to? So maybe you could tell us about your um, online tutorials and give our viewers some advice. So yeah, people can try gold work embroidery. I have some tutorials online mm -hmm. and they are hours of tutorials that show you all the different techniques and talk about the gold in depth. Mm -hmm. And I take students through step-by-step -step of projects to create your own end finished result which I think is a nice way to teach technique because yeah. you have something to show at the end for yeah. your newfound skills so these are an example and they are suitable for beginners so if you can thread a needle you can literally do some goal work and something like the monogram key ring um, this is a really great starting project so as you can see as we've talked about before this is the Japanese thread couched onto the surface um, so that's where you would start and then you can progress your skills from there. So that's a really nice starting project. And we've got something like the, the brooch, which is a really beautiful brooch. So we'll start to introduce some other skills. Mm -hmm. You've got the pearl in this one, um, stretched out pearl in there. We also teach you ways of attaching the kid leather mm -hmm. and that's used yeah. quite a lot in yeah. gold work. Um, these are lovely copper coloured gold threads in that one so that's really nice so you'll accumulate your skills as you go through the course and do some other projects something like the queen bee pendant I think a lot of people will like this one <laughs> this is my favorite definitely yeah. um so this again it uses the skills that you've learned earlier on um it's, it's not too daunting at all as i say it is suitable for beginners and i will take you step by step through everything to create that pendant and as you progress on, you can make the Christmas bauble. Mm. So they make really nice gifts as well and things like that. So it's just nice to kind of show off new skills in this way and have something to show for it. Well, I would love to see you do some gold work embroidery. So do you have a project you're currently working on to show us? So I'm working on a project at the moment, which is quite interesting, actually. It's a way of working gold work in quite a modern way and a mm -hmm. different way so it's more I would say um an artistic way to use the gold work um three-dimensional so you can you can create the gold work on any surface so this is on a copper mesh mm. and it's a commission for a 3d piece of art <clears throat> so it's textiles art and this is a bird's head yeah so it's going to be a complete pelican bird yeah. And it will be shaped, so the metal base will be shaped to give the three-dimensional shape to the bird, and it will be a, a centerpiece for the art piece. Well, yeah. It's really beautiful, and I love the colours you're using for it as well. Yeah, the really beautiful colours, the copper colours. Yeah. Um, so some of the techniques in this are, um, you know, I've couched down the threads on there. That's a passing thread on the top, we're using the padding underneath. Um, some of this is the pearl that we've placed down in, uh, it's cut work, called cut work and I've mixed this with some beading as well so it's quite you can take gold work to the next level and yeah, introduce yeah. different techniques different kind of embroidery with the gold work and it gets a really lovely effect well that's very very beautiful <laughs> yeah so I can't show you anything on that as in for a demonstration um, but it's quite suitable for me to kind of show you something from one of the kits that I have so here we've got the queen bee pendant and I'm going to show you how to create the body of the bee, mm -hmm. just really simply. Show you that it's not as daunting as it looks. It's really quite simple. So I've thread my needle and I've placed on here some felt padding. And that gives the 3D shape of the bee here. And then I just simply start in the centre of the body of the bee, bring my thread up. And here I've already cut my gold to size. So I'm just going to pick up one of those... Um, that's the check here. Bear with me a sec. And as we said before, we just place the needle through the center of the check where it's hollow. Yeah, okay. You really thread it. Right just thread through. it through like you would thread yeah. a bead. Take it to the bottom of the thread. 
lay it across the padding and take your needle back down the other side. And the gold will just hug the padding really nicely. Yeah. And this tool is called a malore. And you just use that to kind of get the gold into the exact position you would like it to be in. And just get it in the exact shape you want it to be. And that's the first stripe of our B. Then you just come straight back up beneath that with your needle. And just repeat the process with whichever threads you want wanting to use. So here we've got this smooth pearl. This is the tricky part, just getting used to handling the gold. Mm. Um, but you do get used to it. Um, you just thread that in again like you would thread a bead. And you just lay that gently beneath the check pearl. Take your needle to the back, like so. Threads can get a little bit tangled. Just smooth those out. And yes, use your malaw to put that right into the shape you want. And there you've got the start of your goal work B. That's beautiful. <laughs> You're right, it is a little bit less daunting than I expected. There you go, yeah. And you can buy this pendulum as a kit, is that right? Yeah, so the kits are available for all of the projects, different levels, and it contains everything you need, the gold materials and the pendant itself and everything, so the complete... Um, equipment is in there well that's wonderful since you also have the online tutorials to go with them maybe i'll try one of them well thank you for being on fruity knitting it's been a very fun interview especially because it's my first one i'm very happy that i got to interview you thank so you so let's say goodbye to the audience bye bye bye